Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. What an awfully long title. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk amongst so many of the world leaders. I'd like to go from what you just heard so clearly explained by Michael Schubert to an, a further evolution, and that is uh, multi-level transferaminal endoscopic spine surgery. So, as you've seen, we pass down through the foramen, and you'd expect to see a nice, clear working zone when you get there. And of course, if you're just going for endoscopic discectomy, you won't really see this area. You'll be going straight into the disc. But in fact, most times, you're faced with this. You can see the nerve, you just see the border of it there, and it's deeply tethered. We're looking from the right-hand side, and there is the facet margin hiding there. And that is the tethering which is causing an awful lot of the patient's symptoms. So for raminoplasty, now as Michael said, we need to define terms. When I first used for raminoplasty, it was to work on the foramen on the nerve to make sure that you restore its pulsatility and its mobility and the dissection goes from the release of the superior foraminal ligament across here, exposure of the lower part of the ganglion, and freeing the nerve from the disc and all these ligaments here, and the facet joint which may be impinging on the nerve, all the way down to the inferior pedicle. Once you've done that, then you can turn your attention to whatever pathology lies in the disc, high intensity zones or disc protrusions. And as Sang Ho Lee was stressing, not major discectomy, but herniectomy. Because the more disc you take out, the more you will make for problems in the future. So we have to be thinking beyond what we're talking about now to what we're doing to the patient's outcome five or 10 years from now. So when you have done the clearance, this is the sort of vision you'll get. You'll see the blue here. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm operating on royalty. It means that we put a blue dye in the disc to define the annulus, for it also shows which bits of the annulus are particularly thin. And you'll see here that the nerve has been mobilized from the disc. There's your superior foraminal ligament and the inferior pedicle down here. I've turned the endoscope through 90 degrees. It shows how incredibly red and inflamed the nerve can be. I'm pleased that epidural fat was now coming through under the resected superior foraminal ligament. That fat will protect the nerve over the longer term. It's a bit like the fat that we have in our abdomen. What are the problems that we face as conventional surgeons? Well, we operate on the patient asleep and I would strongly counsel that we train our anaesthetists to do the TIVA procedure that allows you to operate on the patients with them partially awake. It is your biggest safety, but more importantly, it leads you to the source of the pain, overcomes conceptual errors, diagnostic errors, and as a result of these, we've all walked backwards. We now send the majority of patients in England to chronic pain management for months and, and months and months. We should swing back. We should start to use these much safer, minimally invasive techniques to give patients the, the benefits that we know that we can achieve in the long term. So listening to patients over now some 24 years, what we find is that back pain comes from the nerve. If you touch the nerve lightly, you'll produce back pain. If you press it more firmly, then you'll produce the radicular pain. So that pain can arise from foraminal nerve compression. That can be due to physical nerve dysfunction, and you'll see it on the MRI scan. But otherwise, you can see it as irritation arising from byproducts or impaction, or foraminal tethering, which you find very difficult to see on the MRI scan. Yes, we talk about discogenic pain, but when you probe the disc, I only find true discogenic pain in about 11% of the patients. Discogenic pain diagnosed by discography 
I believe is the result of displacing that tethered nerve physically by putting the fluid in the disc. So you're back with the nerve being the source of the pain. Unless there is a leak and there are angry, uh, nociceptive, uh, painful products coming out of the disc. And especially when that is long term and leads to further foraminal tethering. And instability, the byword by which we then suggest that the patient has a fusion. It doesn't really exist. It isn't an unstable spine. It's a spine that's undergoing abnormal micro movements, and those impinge upon the nerve and produce the back pain. So we should be able to do something about it. Let's look at those pain sources. Here's the superior foraminal ligament, and as we're in France, we should call it Madame la Guillotine, because it's there to cut into the nerve as you lose disc height and you get abnormal micromovements. The same occurs with the overriding facet joint. This becomes a hammer on the nerve. Then you get tethering between the nerve and the disc, and then the nerve is secondarily distorted. You get tethering between the facet joint and the nerve, and some of these ligaments, of course, are the natural <coughs> ones that are there that seem to thicken with age or irritation. And then you get nerve impaction, all made worse by high-intensity zones and leaking discs or post-operative perineural scarring. Looked at another way, we've all been brought up to believe that a postural lateral compression at this level would produce pain in the descending nerve. But too often we forget the effects of the superior foraminal ligament, the ascending facet joint, osteophytes out in the foramen, which we call shoulder osteophytes, all impacting on the nerve and further aggravated by an inflamed disc. So let's just look at a simple example. Here is a patient who has pain radiating into the sacroiliac joint, buttock and hamstring, has obviously had previous surgery. But if you look here, you'll see that the nerve is tethered to the superior foraminal ligament and to the disc. And this poor patient had it at two levels, and we address two levels with benefit to the patient. Here's a diabetic patient on warfarin, and this is a dynamic CT. And you'll see the patient is hinging at this level, so you'll expect that disc to fail or also to produce lots of irritation of the nerve in that foramen. And here you'll see the foramina are grossly diminished and pinching the nerve. So these are the reasons that in this patient, we went in, we did discography, there was no leak, and so we put in gel sticks as a prophylaxis against the likely degeneration at that hinging level, and we'll work on that patient with advanced physiotherapy to try and improve the movement patterns and at these levels went forwards with foraminal decompression, and at this level with the full foraminoplasty. So here I need to define the upper of those two levels had uh, more like a simpler endoscopic foraminotomy, but the lower level where there was lots of tethering had the full foraminoplasty with mobilization throughout that foramen. You've heard the use of these techniques with spondylolytic spondylolisthesis. You saw a lovely case just a moment ago from Michael. Here we're doing the same thing. What you're doing is cutting back the bone that um, is, affecting the, is affecting the exiting and descending nerves. In many of these cases, they have a distorted disc, not quite like the one you've just seen, but most will have a distorted, very hard disc. You don't need to touch that. You need to mobilize the nerve and get rid of their pain, both back pain and leg pain. Here's a very dear lady with long-standing scoliosis who had a short history of, say, about three years of severe back and leg pain. And we've opened up the doorways, and now she's comfortable from walking around and still has her scoliosis, which hasn't progressed. 
the application of foraminoplasty is based on find the pain source, be led to the pain source by the patient, and then remove the elements that are causal. And the patient will tell you. And so you have now a full raft of degenerative disease in the spine that you can treat, from the protrusions through spondylolisthesis, stenosis, fail back surgery, troublesome discs, and adult scoliosis. Well, let's look at the results of treatment of the single predominant level. And we tended to treat this over the years with the foraminoplasty at one level and perhaps a laser discectomy at the adjacent level. The single level outcomes in a catchment group of 70% fail back surgery <clears throat> seem to defy ageist problems and comorbidities because the patient didn't have a general anesthetic, 80% success at two to four years, and we're just publishing the 10-year results on that at 79, sorry, 72%. And that indicates that these techniques are, render a prophylactic protection for our patients. The complications were three to seven times less than microdiscectomy infusion, an order less severe, and only eight recurrences in the first 958 patients that I did. A recent audit on over seven and a half, 7,700 patients showed nine infections, seven dural tears, and the majority returning to work in four to six weeks. But what about combination foraminoplasty? At the prime level, we'll do the foraminoplasty and or an endoscopic discectomy or laser discectomy and an annulaplasty, that's shrinking the posterior wall back to a more normal uh, position. At the lesser painful level, we would do the foraminotomy and or discectomy, etc. At the third level, a laser discectomy if it's required or an annulaplasty. And at the fourth level, gel sticks. That would be the maximum. So looking at the spinal foundation outcome criteria. Now this, these are based on a study we did on 150 patients and asked, did we really help you? Because I don't find that the McNabs and the other tests really define that the patient has been helped to a significant clinical degree. And this is because we hide the fact that we're not always reporting on back pain, not always reporting on leg pain. So there are three main pain zones in this technique. The back, the buttocks, groins, and thigh, and the pain arising below the knee. To get a good or excellent result, let me define that better. An excellent result means you've won on all levels. A good result is you've got to reduce the pain and double the functionality in all three zones. If you fail in one zone, they're only satisfactory. And they're poor if they don't meet satisfactory and worse if they're worse. So here's the study on 80 patients looked at one to two years later after multi-level uh, foraminoplasty. And you'll see the different combinations that you get. The bulk were foraminoplasty, foraminotomy, and laser discectomy. And in others, we added gel sticks where the disc was not leaking and was broad-based. And this group, 40% failed back surgery, age range 46 to 89. And bearing in mind what uh, Professor Loy was saying earlier about the aging population, the fact that we can now treat patients in these aging groups is going to be very, very important in the future. We didn't in this series have any complications. And looking at the results, uh, 53 out of the 80 fell into the excellent and good results in multi-level <coughs> pathologies. So in summary, single and multi-level foraminal uh, decompression, foraminoplasty, really centers on foraminoplasty, centers on the philosophy of prophylaxis, it's excellent for the treatment of failed back surgery. It can treat a wide spectrum of degenerative pathology in the spine, and particularly in the aged and infirm. And I think that you'll find shortly that it's going to become a very good vehicle for stem cell disc regeneration. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin.